Good evening, everyone. It's great to have you back, some of you who attended the first two modules. And if you're joining us here for the first time, this is uh, module number three, a survey of the New Testament. My name is Gerard Fender, for those of you who don't uh, know or those I haven't met before. And I am the director of studies of Rosebank Bible College, but I'm also a pastor of Rosebank Union Church, where we offer the course here uh, through or on behalf of Rosebank Bible College. And it's great to have you uh, join us. And uh, before we pray together, which we will do in a moment, uh, every week as we come together, we'll start with a short devotion, just some thoughts that I want to gather up um, as, as we start before we get into the lecture time itself. And uh, tonight I want to read from the first book of the New Testament because that's a survey of the New Testament that we're doing. So it's quite obvious that I'll be reading from the New Testament. In fact, every week as we come together, I will be reading from a particular book or a section uh, or a verse or two from the books that we will be looking at uh, in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. If you have ever read through the Old Testament then you will notice that when you come to the end of Malachi, there is literally one single page that divides the Old Testament from the New Testament. However, uh, if you have <clears throat> done a bit of study on the Old Testament, you will know that the divide uh, chronologically is quite big. We're talking about at least 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. 400 years that are not described for us in the Bible itself. And so we'll look a little bit at that uh, when we introduce the, the New Testament tonight. Uh, before we get into the books of the New Testament, we'll look at that. But there's a huge amount of information uh, that is missing between the Old Testament in this one page, this empty page that is in my Bible. And as we start with the New Testament, it simply assumes a huge amount of knowledge that we don't necessarily have as we dig into the New Testament. And so it starts and it says, a record of the genealogy, genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, the son of Abraham. It goes on, and I'm not going to read the names because we now have a list of 14 plus 14 plus 13 names. And Matthew gives a very particular uh, genealogy of Jesus in his account. Now, the only other place where we find a genealogy of Jesus is in the Gospel of Luke. And if you're sharp enough, which I'm not, uh, then you will pick up that the two genealogies are not exactly the same. Um, and it's, uh, scholars disagree on exactly why that is. Some reason that Matthew took Joseph's line um, and that Luke took Mary's line and that she was also in the line of David. That cannot exactly be proved. Uh, we don't have any uh, scientific or historical proof of that. The reality is that neither Matthew nor Luke would have quoted a genealogy that um, the Jews especially would have been able to pull apart and say uh, sort of laughingly, ha ah, ha ha, just look at your genealogy, it can't be true. So they must have quoted some sources that they had, ac that they had access to. Um, Matthew seems to be quoting from the Septuagint when he quotes his, and he follows the royal line uh, from both of them between Abraham and David, uh, describe the same genealogy. It's from uh, David onwards that they start disagreeing, where Matthew follows Solomon's line and uh, Luke follows Nathan's line uh, when you look at the genealogies. Um, it was quite a common thing to quote genealogies uh, to try and prove where you came from and who you are, and especially if you're a priest or, a, or of royal descent or something like that. You want to prove to your fellow Jews that you come from this line. Uh, when you go back to the books of Nehemiah, Esther, Ezra and Nehemiah, you will find that they actually disqualified certain people from serving in the temple because they couldn't prove their genealogy, that they were descending from uh, Aaron the priest or whatever. And so, uh, as a start of the Gospel of Matthew, it was important for Matthew to lay a solid foundation to prove that Jesus is in the line of two. The one is David, and that's the royal line. 
The other one is Abraham, and that's the covenant line. And so Abraham is the one who was called by God, and he became the father of Israel. 2,000 years B.C., go back into the Old Testament and into our time, our chrono chronology, and you will pick that up. And a thousand years on, and you have David on the throne, and David became the king of Israel. And for Matthew, it's important to point out that Jesus is in the line of both Abraham, the covenant father of the Israelites, as well as in the line of David, the royal line of Israel and ultimately of Judah. And then as you go on, Matthew says uh, in verse 17 of chapter 1, Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile uh, to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to Christ. And uh, what he is doing is leaving out certain names in order to make up the 14. And 14 is a multiplication of 7, which is the complete number. And so Matthew is playing with the numbers. And what he's really saying is that Jesus is the perfect Messiah. Jesus is in the line of Abraham, the covenant father, the line of David, and ultimately he is the perfect Messiah promised by God. Uh, when you go to Luke, and I'm not going to go to Luke right now, but you'll see that Luke actually reverses the genealogy. He starts with Joseph, and he works his way backwards, and he ends up, he goes way past Abraham, and he ends up with Adam, and he says, and Adam was the son of God. And so Luke takes it one step further. Not only is Jesus the descendant of David and Abraham, but is actually the descendant of Adam. Luke writes, and as we will see later on, primarily with a Gentile audience in mind or a readership in mind. And so for him it's important to prove not so much that Jesus is in the line of Abraham, the covenant father of Israel, but actually that Jesus is in the line of Adam, the father of humanity. And therefore he becomes the father of all human people, all those who accept Jesus and put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. So it's a wonderful thing. It's not the kind of thing you do in your quiet time, read through a genealogy like this. It's quite boring, actually, because one name after the other. But when you look deeper and you, you look for the reason why Luke and Matthew chose to, uh, to write about the genealogy of Jesus, then some of these things uh, really jump to, uh, to the fore and uh, prove to us that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the real covenant person, the covenant of, of God with us, and he is the, the son of David and the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And that's what the New Testament ultimately is all about. As Before we start uh, getting into our lecture time, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for an opportunity to come and study your word. We thank you for the fact that the Old Testament story continues into the New Testament with the birth of and the coming of Jesus, his death on the cross, his resurrection and ascension to heaven, and therefore also the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that as we go through the books of the New Testament, as, as, as it unfolds before us, as the story of the New Testament unfolds before us, that you would lead us and guide us in our thoughts, and that you would strengthen our faith through this study. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, welcome to the study of the New Testament. The survey of the New Testament is the third of four modules, and I call them the foundational modules because they all really lay a foundation for where we are heading. Uh, we have so far looked at an introduction to the Bible, and in that first module, for those of you who missed it, um, you, at, at some later stage you can pick that up, but we have actually looked at this book. We have looked at the fact that this is the Word of God. It is inspired. We looked at the history of Israel. We talked about the content of the Bible, why we believe that these 66 books are inspired, why only these books and not the others, um, and how we can uh, believe in the reliability of the, the actual wording that we have or the words that are contained in this Bible. So that was in module number one. In the second module, we did a survey of the Old Testament. It was a, uh, a quick survey. We had to to do a quick exercise going through 39 books uh, in the Old Testament. And that leads us to the New Testament study, uh, which is where we are right now. 
And um, in this module, we will look at God continuing to reveal Himself. And, and I actually emphasize the word continue, because I honestly believe God has one single plan, a plan that He devised before the creation of the universe. And that plan, although it took a few little deviations through Israel and the sin and everything else, but ultimately the plan is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the bringing forth of Jesus, the very Word of God into this world. And then ultimately the plan will consummate. Uh, that's one word that we use. It will be finally completed when Jesus comes back a second time and eternity arrives and the kingdom of God arrives in its fullest sense of the word. And um, that's a bit of the story that we'll look at when we get to the fourth module. Because after traveling through the Old Testament and then now t through the New Testament, we then need to take a step back and say, okay, how does it all fit together? And uh, that's what we do in that final module, if you want to hang around that long uh, towards the end of the year, in the fourth quarter of this year. When we talk about surveying the New Testament, um, I would encourage you to look at your course outline. There's several things that I need to, uh, that you need to know about in terms of the requirements for this course, in terms of attendance and reading and assignments that you need to hand in. But during this time, um, in the next eight weeks, we're going to travel uh, chronologically from about 400 B.C., uh, which I mentioned earlier already, all the way to about 100 A.D., uh, our era. Um, that's roughly the time of the end of the writing of the New Testament. And we're going to take um, a journey through the life of Jesus in the Gospels and then the beginning of the church in the book of Acts and then how the church has been guided through letter writing by several of the apostles, mainly the Apostle Paul and several of the others. And then by about 95, 96, John the Apostle probably wrote the book of Revelation. In terms of the writing of the books that we have in the New Testament, that's where our study of the New Testament will end, and that's where it will take us. We'll take a look uh, at the historical background of the New Testament. Every time we get to a book, we'll talk about who wrote it, when it was written, what's the main theme, the focus of that book, some of the highlights of the book, and try and put all of that in historical context. Uh, as we uh, journey through the, the whole of the New Testament. In terms of prescribed material, and I call it prescribed, uh, those are the books that I have, or these are the books that I have used. This is Johnston, um, and it's an, the IVP introduction to the Bible. And uh, in my notes, you will find that I refer to this particular edition that I have in my hands, the page numbers. If you have a copy, it may be a later edition, and so the page numbers may differ. Uh, that's not critical. You'll be able to find it very quickly. And uh, Johnston provides us, um, as, as does this one, Harris and several other authors who put this together, provide us with information about both the Old and the New Testament, plus some of the information that we have dealt with in um, the uh, introduction to the Bible in the first module. And the other one that I uh, highly recommend is uh, Holman Bible Atlas or any atlas that takes you on a journey through the Bible and uh, chronologically because that provides you with background information about the Bible. It doesn't study the Bible pages as such. Uh, it doesn't give you an introduction to the Bible books, but it gives you an introduction to the geography, the chronology, uh, the background, archaeology, and all those kind of information. Uh, you will find in a book like uh, Holman's Bible Atlas and any other uh, good atlas. If you can't get hold of these books, and I think at the moment our bookshop may have some of this in stock, um, but if you can't get hold of them, then um, any other good introduction uh, to the New Testament or a survey of the New Testament will suffice. Um, I also recommend uh, searching the internet. Uh, just with a word of caution that you don't always know the source of uh, internet uh, articles. And so be very, very wary or careful when you do your internet searches uh, to find more information. Now tonight as we uh, kick off with our survey of the New Testament, uh, we're going to do a brief survey of the history between the Testaments. We've done this in detail in a two-hour lecture uh, in the first module. But in order to paint a picture of the background of the New Testament, I'm going to take you on a very brief tour 
of that period uh, that I call the empty page between the Old Testament and the New Testament, just to put the history in perspective as we launch into uh, the New Testament. And then we're going to look as a result of that at how God prepared the world for the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, and the spreading of the gospel. I'm going to uh, briefly look at the literature types or the genres that we find in the New Testament. And then tonight, when we delve into the New Testament itself, we're going to look at what has become known as the Synoptic Gospels, the first three Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Required reading, uh, you'll find that in your notes, and so again, I encourage you to do the additional reading. I can only say so much in a two-hour slot, and I, on, I, I really want to uh, encourage you to read further and beyond, uh, and especially if something grabs your attention, you say, I need to make a note of that. I want to find out more about that particular um, either topic or book or background or passage in the Bible. And I need to also caution you, this is not a Bible study as such, and therefore we do not have time in the two-hour slot to actually do a study of, of some sections in the Bible. I will refer to, I will ask you to read some passages in the Bible, uh, in the New Testament uh, in particular in this module, uh, but there is no time to do a proper Bible study in, in our time together. So this is not what this course uh, is all about. Right, so as we look at the New Testament and the background, uh, how God prepared the world uh, for the coming of Jesus the Messiah. Um, I, I, I call it God preparing the world, but you can obviously also look at it purely as history, and it is pure history. Uh, but I believe that we need to look beyond pure history by looking at how God over time prepared the world. And in that is a lesson for us as well, because even now, God is preparing the world for the coming, the second coming of Jesus the Messiah. How he's doing that, how it will all pan out, I cannot predict. Nobody can tell us. Um, but we, we know that God is at work uh, behind the scenes and sometimes not just so behind the scenes uh, anyway. When we look at the New Testament and the backgrounds, the events of the New Testament, the birth uh, of Jesus, his life, the start of the early church, it all happened in the context of the Middle East. And uh, again, a, a book like the Bible Atlas will give you uh, a great perspective on the geography of the land of Israel and that whole region. And I will have a couple of maps to show you uh, in, in a few moments' time. But it also needs to be read against at least a 2,000-year history of Israel itself. That it's, it started with Abraham, the calling of Abraham, when God called him from what is modern-day Iraq and he moved across the Mesopotamia and ended up traveling around up and down Canaan, going down to Egypt a couple of times. Ultimately, uh, his grandson Jacob had 12 sons, and Joseph ended up in Egypt, and that leads us to the Exodus, and then the conquering of the land of Canaan. And uh, we've done that history in the Old Testament, and then the settling in the land uh, about 1200 or so B.C., from that point on, we have a 1,200-year history in the land of Canaan, which became the land of Israel, ultimately split in two with uh, Samaria, uh, the capital city of Israel in the north, and Jerusalem, the capital city of, of uh, the south, uh, of Judah. And then the north was destroyed, 722, and they ceased to exist. Um, uh, the Assyrians overthrew the, the Israel, the northern kingdom. In 586, Judah was overthrown and Jerusalem and the temple destroyed by the Babylonians. They went into exile. Um, and in 538, the Persian Empire took over. And this is where our New Testament era really kicks in. And the people were released to go back. If they wished to, if they wished to go back, they were able to, to go back and they rebuilt the temple, ultimately the wall of Jerusalem and the book of Nehemiah. And uh, this is where uh, we will pick up the story as we prepare to enter into the New Testament phase. And so what I want to uh, emphasize tonight is that we, we never really can understand the New Testament fully unless you understand something of the Old Testament. And in more particular, we need to understand the events that led up to the New Testament time, the birth of Jesus Christ 
uh, and beyond. As I said to you, as you open the New Testament, there's a huge amount of assumption or assumed information that is not recorded in the Bible. And I'm going to do a very brief little tour through those events uh, as we uh, enter into the New Testament time. This is um, on the screen a map of the New Testament world to some extent. And you have Israel um, right here on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Ocean with Africa, the North African region with Egypt over here. Um, and then we have Asia Minor. And Asia Minor is going to become very important as, as we hit Acts, the book of Acts next week. Uh, Asia Minor will, will actually come into focus. And then this side of uh, Europe and all the way to Italy, Rome, uh, and that's essentially where the book of, of Acts ends, is in the, in the city of, of Rome. Paul even had in mind to go to Spain on the western side of Europe. Uh, we, we have no record in the Bible itself of uh, the apostles actually going there. Uh, but there is a tradition, uh, as we will uh, see uh, next week, uh, and later, actually not next week, but later on, that Paul was released from prison at the end of the book of Acts, and that he ended up going to Spain. And whether that tradition is true or not, we, we have no way of, of verifying. But it's against this sort of map, this geography, that we need to understand the events of uh, the New Testament. So from the Old Testament, where the focus is obviously Israel and Can Canaan, but the Mesopotamian area and uh, Babel or Babylonia, and Nineveh in the north, those things begin to sort of disappear in the background. And the focus is shifting uh, towards uh, the more western side of this map. Uh, and I'm talking about Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and then Europe, uh, essentially. And that's where the New Testament uh, history uh, eventually uh, ends up focusing on. When we look at um, just a summary of the periods, some of you will, will uh, remember this. It will be familiar information. But the Persians took over in 538 King Cyrus, uh, was the first of the Persian kings, and the Persian Empire lasted until uh, the Greeks or Alexander the Greek overthrew the Persian Empire, and that was from the year 538 to 332. And then, in a short space of time, Alexander the Great established Greek as the as the international language, um, and he followed a system. And uh, people beyond him or after him, uh, people who came after him. Um, uh, enforced what they call Hellenization, and that is to make the, the, the world Greek, to speak Greek, to think Greek, Greek philosophy and all those kind of things uh, happened during that time. And in a very short period of time, Alexander the Great was able to establish a very large empire. After his death, um, the, uh, his empire split into four, uh, four of his generals took over, and what became important to us in terms of Israel at the time is the Egyptian era uh, from about 320 to 200, 120 year period where essentially Palestine was dominated by the, uh, what became known as the Ptolemies, Ptolemy 1, 2, 3, and 4, and they dominated that whole area, but they were at war with the Syrians in the north, and so ultimately the Syrians took over, and from about 200 to 142, and you'll see a bit of an overlap with the Maccabees, um, you, will have, you have the Syrian era. But during that time, from about 167 to 142, the Maccabees had a, a, a rebellious war against the Syrians, ultimately overthrowing the Syrians and establishing the Hasmonean period. Um, and this was the only time during this entire period that we are looking at before Christ as well as into our era that Israel ever was independent. Uh, and this was a period of um, from about 142 to 63. So just under 100 years or so, they were actually independent and they had their own rulers uh, and no foreign empire ruled over uh, Israel as such. But then in 63, the Roman Empire or the Romans came, they um, took control of that region, and that became the status quo from that point on for another four, five hundred years. The Roman Empire dominated the world, and, um, um, and, and even the events in the New Testament need to be read against the background of the Roman domination. And we find lots and lots of evidence of that, all the way from 
Pilate, who was the one who sent Jesus to be crucified, all the way to Paul ending up in Rome in prison and ultimately being executed by uh, the Emperor Nero in about 66 or so uh, AD. So this provides you with the backdrop uh, of the New Testament or the events of the New Testament. On the screen you will find um, the Hasmonean period and there were several of them. There was John and Simon, Judas, uh, Eleazar and Jonathan. And uh, John Hyrcanus became a very important and a key figure uh, during that time. Uh, after him, there were two of his sons, Alexander, uh, Janius, as well as Aristobulus, uh, and so on. And it was Hyrcanus and Aristobulus II who had a fight with one another. They called in the Romans, and the Romans came, and from 63, uh, they took over uh, the country. But before... And during the intertestamental period, Israel and Judah moved from having been an independent kingdom un under uh, David especially, Solomon, during that time. This was the golden era of Israel. U unified nation, one big nation. After Solomon, it split into two, but they still maintained their, their independence, both of them. But when uh, Samaria fell, 722 B.C., and after that, uh, after 586, when Jerusalem fell. From that point on, uh, Israel was on shaky grounds uh, in terms of their uh, empire or their kingdom uh, and certainly in terms of the independence. So apart from that short Hasmonean period, uh, Israel was ever, uh, was ever under domination by a foreign uh, empire. By the time Jesus was born, uh, there were three provinces, Judah in the south, uh, Samaria sandwiched between uh, Judah in the south and Galilee in the north. And uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the south. Uh, but we know that's because his father, um, or Joseph, and his, his mother uh, had to go there because they were in the line of David. At least Joseph was. Um, but Jesus grew up in Galilee, which was in the north, um, and oftentimes traveled su through Samaria. The world, uh, in terms of being prepared by God, if you look at that whole history and you summarize that, and you look at how God prepared the world, and uh, Israel, the Israelites or the Jews at the time may not have thought so. Uh, if you're under foreign rule, if you're especially being persecuted by the Syrians, uh, there were horrific things that happened uh, with the Syrians in control. Um, uh, desecrating the temple, uh, offering a pig uh, on the altar in the temple and that sort of thing. Uh, obviously, uh, the Jews would have questioned even my remark right now, and that is that God was busy and God was working behind the scenes. But uh, just a few little things, and we have looked at this in detail in the first module, but just to remind us that the Jewish diaspora uh, or the dispersion ensured a wide spread of Jews and of Judaism around the world. Interesting comment that we find in Acts chapter 2 uh, at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Luke, who is the author of Acts, makes the comment that there were Jews from every nation in the world. Now, it's a bit of an exaggeration, of course, but the reality is over a four, five, six hundred year period, the Jews were actually scattered around the world, which is actually still true till today when you really come to think of it. But they were scattered all over the world. And that laid a very strong foundation, an open door for the first missionaries to go into the world. Wherever they went, they found family, if you wish, in inverted commas. The Jewish diaspora or dispersion provided that opportunity for Christian missionaries to go into the world and find people of, of like um, affinity, uh, culture, language, and everything else, speaking virtually the same language, not, not just Hebrew uh, or Aramaic at the time or Greek, but, but also the same kind of theological language because they represent the Judaism around the world. Talking of language, it's an amazing accomplishment that in a few short years, Alexander the Great took Greek philosophy, thinking, and the language into the world 300 years before Jesus came to this world. And when the missionaries went into, um, into other parts of the world, they used Greek to speak, to preach, to write. The whole of the New Testament was written in Greek. We have no evidence 
that any other language was used. There are a few arguments that perhaps Matthew wrote it in Aramaic, it was then translated into Greek, but actually the, the evidence is so weak as far as that is concerned that one has to come to the conclusion that the whole of the New Testament was written in the language Greek. And so Paul, as he traveled, was able to speak Greek and immediately had an audience because people spoke Greek as the language. And then the Roman infrastructure provided the safety, the security, the roads, um, the, the peace that they needed, the Pax Romana, as it, as it became known, to actually travel around the world. Uh, in a period of about 100 years, there were no major wars fought uh, during the early spread of Christianity. And that provided a safe environment, a relatively safe environment for people to travel. So the Roman infrastructure provided the means by which the gospel entered into the world. And then from a Jewish point of view, the Messianic expectation was extremely high. When we uh, looked at the Old Testament, we realized that probably Malachi represents the last of the prophetic voices uh, in the Old Testament. This is, if you wish, the last time God spoke authentically in the Old Testament. Now, if, Matthew, uh, if Malachi lived and preached about 450 or 500, even 400 years B.C., it leaves generations of people, 400 years of people struggling, grappling, reading the Scriptures, and over time, and especially as, as you look at extra-biblical literature during that time, there was this heightened expectation of a Messiah, the Son of David, that was going to come. And so the world, the, Ju Ju the Judaic world, was ready for the Messiah. Tragically, they, re they rejected Jesus, but it doesn't take away the fact that there was a, a real expectation of Jesus or, or of a Messiah that was going to come. Some of the other things that are simply assumed in the New Testament are the, the kind of Jewish groups that we find in the New Testament. As you go into the pages, you never read about Pharisees or Sadducees or Samaritans, any of those. You don't read about them in the Old Testament. They simply assume, that's assumed knowledge in the New Testament. So maybe we just need to give attention to that for a few moments. The Pharisees, they were the biggest religious party of the Jewish uh, community at the time of the birth of Jesus. It is not known when and how they actually came into existence. But somewhere in the 400 years uh, since the return from the exile in 538 until the birth of Jesus, uh, in that whole political melting pot in, in uh, the land of Palestine, uh, the Pharisees came into existence. And similarly, the Sadducees. These were two major strong political stroke religious parties, and they dominated the political and religious environment uh, during the time of Jesus. Now, by the time of Jesus, the Sadducees uh, were a smaller party. They were smaller to the Pharisees. The Pharisees dominated, and there were certain differences between them. And you can read up more about them um, in our uh, textbooks as well as on the Internet. And then the, there was the Sanhedrin. Again, the Sanhedrin is simply assumed in the New Testament, but we don't find it in the Old Testament. This was the highest Jewish authority, consisting of Pharisees and Sadducees. At one stage it was dominated, um, some years before Jesus came, dominated by the Sadducees, but slowly the weight sort of uh, went in the direction of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees, by the time of Jesus, actually dominated um, the, the Sanhedrin. And uh, these were a, a number of people, uh, Jewish leaders who came together, and they had oversight over the mostly religious and cultural aspects of Judaism. Politically speaking, they were under the Romans, and uh, you had a procurator or a governor or whatever, a Roman person watching over them. But to a large extent, from a cultural and religious point of view, the Romans had their hands off, uh, and they allowed the Jews to dominate and to regulate their own uh, beliefs in this regard. There was another group, you don't find this word in the New Testament, but there, there's lots of evidence of uh, sort of breakaway Jewish groups. We call them the Essenes, uh, which is a collective name or a, a noun for some breakaway, uh, mostly eccentric groups. The Dead Sea Scrolls uh, really are the documents uh, talking about or documenting the beliefs and the cultural practices of a group that has become known as the Qumran community. Uh, 
Um, some people believe that John the Baptist may have been either an eccentric sort of uh, Essene or he had contact with people like that, at least in the desert, because many of them just went down south either to Masada or Qumran or down around about the, uh, the Dead Sea uh, and so forth. And then there were the Samaritans. Nobody knows exactly when they uh, originated. Uh, the Jews obviously say that it is because of the mixture uh, that the Assyrians brought in when they took Samaria uh, in 722. The Samaritans deny that. And they are still in existence still today. There are two groupings of Samaritans in Israel. Uh, the one is near Nablus, which is uh, Shechem, the Old Testament Shechem. And the other one is in the outskirts of Tel Aviv. You still find Samaritans. And they... They do what Jews hope to do, and that is they still bring sacrifices. Uh, and, of course, they had lots and lots of disagreements, and enmity existed between Jews and Samaritans. And we pick them up in the New Testament, sometimes in a story, and certainly in some of the activities of Jesus, we find uh, the Samaritans. There were the zealots. We find them in the New Testament. It is believed that a couple of the disciples were zealots. They were underground uh, sort of terror terrorists, if you wish. Uh, we would call them today. Uh, but they worked very strongly for Jewish independence. And they were always against the Romans, and they were militaristic. And so it's interesting that a couple of them actually joined Jesus, uh, and several of them were in the bigger crowd, uh, following Jesus, watching to see what he was doing, and maybe he was our hope, maybe he would become our general, uh, sort of thing. But, but certainly some of them, a couple of them came to know Christ. Uh, some uh, scholars even believe that Judah, uh, Judas uh, was... Uh, was a, a zealot and that he actually tried to force Jesus' hand uh, in handing him over to the Jews, hoping that that would force him into some kind of a public action of taking over the kingship and driving out the Romans. Uh, whether that is true or not, we have no way of proving. When it comes to foreign politics in New Testament times, uh, there is the Roman Empire and um, we don't have time to even remotely discuss the detail of the Roman Empire. Uh, I love reading about and watching stories on National Geographic and so on about the Roman Empire. It is really, really fascinating. Uh, the, the amount of knowledge, the skill, the uh, military power, the uh, engineering of, uh, ability of, of the Roman Empire is, is well documented and well known. Uh, but they took control of Judea and the surrounding regions in 63 BC. And uh, they, they followed a policy of trying to find a local uh, under their own guidance and appoint that local as a sort of a king or a governor. And it's the Romans who actually discovered or found Herod the Great. He played his hand, of course, uh, with the Romans um, and, and found their favor. And they appointed Herod the Great. Uh, now, Herod was a half-Jew. Uh, if I remember correctly, his mother was a Jew, and um, his father was an Edomite, and that whole region, we'll look at that in a moment, became known as Edomia, and uh, he came from that region, and the Jews hated him because he wasn't a pure Jew anyway, uh, and um, he was then appointed as the king over the Jews, and that whole big region um, was under Herod the Great. And as in the case of Alexander the Great, when Herod died, his region was divided into three different parts. Uh, and a couple of his sons also picked up the name Herod. Herod Antipas, for example. And so when you go to the New Testament, there are two Herods. And they are, they are not identified for us. That's the unfortunate thing. But there's Herod the Great when Jesus was, was born. And Herod the Great died in 4 BC. And we'll look at that date in a moment. And so after his death, uh, the, the region was divided un, uh, among Archelaus, Antipas, and Philip. And uh, we, we actually um, we meet these three in the New Testament in particular. Uh, and um, one of them, Herod, Antipas, is also called Herod. And he is the other person that was involved in Jesus' uh, uh, hearing or, or execution. And then, of course, there were Roman governors and proconsuls. Rome appointed officials to, uh, to keep control and to keep the peace uh, in the local regions. They always gave a garrison of, of soldiers to these proconsuls. Right next to uh, the temple complex, there was a, uh, another uh, complex where the Romans lived, and they, ke they kept a very, very close control because they, they knew about the temple and the Jews and the zealots and all those. 
uh, and when Paul was arrested or when he was uh, taken by the Jews and there was almost a riot, uh, the Roman soldiers were quick. Uh, they were there and they stopped uh, Paul from being murdered uh, and executed by the Jews. Um, and that's because they were right next to the temple, as it were, um, and were able to, to save his life. But Pontius Pilate was a procurator, uh, was a name for him, over the province of Judea. And that whole, re in fact, that whole region uh, was under him. So along with Herod and a few others, um, they, they maintain control and peace in the region. If you're interested, um, some of these names of the succession of Roman emperors we actually find in the New Testament. Some of them we never read about in the New Testament. But going all the way back to 27 BC, uh, there is Augustus, and we read about Augustus. And um, he uh, reigned as emperor until 14 AD. In other words, it's during the reign of Augustus as Roman emperor that Jesus was born. Then there is Tiberius, and it was under Tiberius that Jesus was crucified, and he rose from the dead, and so on. So those two names are important from, from the, the, the perspective of Jesus' life. But then there is Caligula, uh, Claudius we read about as well in the New Testament, Nero. Nero is important because it was under Nero that persecution uh, was very heavy uh, for the Christians. And it was Paul, uh, or it was actually Nero, who executed Paul uh, according to church tradition. Then there is Ves, uh, Vespasian, and then there is Titus. And Titus is important. Uh, actually, before he became an emperor, uh, he was a general. And it was Titus who um, uh, destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD and also broke down and destroyed the temple. Uh, he was the general uh, of the army, and then later on he was called back to Rome, and uh, he became the emperor. Domitian is another important uh, Roman emperor, emperor from a New Testament perspective. Again, there was a major persecution under his rule of Christians, and it was in, under his rule that John wrote the book of Revelation. And that provides us with a bit of a backdrop to understanding the book of Revelation uh, which we will be looking at in lecture number 8. And then beyond that, we're talking about Nerva, 96 to 98, and then Trajan, 98 to 117, and then the list of Roman emperors uh, goes on. Uh, but for our purposes, that's not uh, that important. In terms of the geography uh, of Israel in the New Testament times, here is another map, and perhaps you can't see everything over here, but here is the province of Judea, this uh, southern region going all the way down. And there is Idumea, south of uh, Judea. And uh, to the north of Judea, and Jerusalem is about there. To the north of, of Jerusalem, you have Samaria. And then to the north of Samaria, there is Galilee. There is the Sea of Galilee. Nazareth is in the middle, roughly in the middle there. Um, and then this area here is Decapolis. Uh, that's an area where Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee and, and somewhere around here he would have um, healed the person or drove out, uh, he would have driven out the demons out of that person who came running to them uh, and so on. And uh, to the north, northwest of this you have Tyre and Sidon uh, which was part of Phoenicia um, and we read about the Syrophoenician woman where Jesus was in that region uh, when he encountered that woman uh, and so on. Here is the Tetrarchy of Philip. That's the region that was inherited by one of the sons of Herod the Great. I've already mentioned the fact that um, the, the country that we came to know as Israel was divided into three provinces. Um, and they were distinct with not necessarily border lines as such, but they were definitely occupied by Jews in the south, Jews, Galilean Jews in the north, and then stuck in the middle were the Samaritans. Uh, and that was the situation back then. The other regions around Judah or around that area included Decapolis, uh, which means ten cities, by the way. Uh, it was northeast of the Jordan. Perea is another word we find in the New Testament that was east of the Jordan. And then Edomia I refer to. That's formerly uh, the, the area or the country of Edom. And then Syria or Phoenicia, north, northwest of Galilee, with Tyre and Sidon on the coast there. The area of Perea, uh, and here is another map where you will see Galilee and, and rough borders there as well. And there is Samaria uh, and Judea in the south. 
per year on the eastern side of the Jordan River with the Jordan River running from the Sea of Galilee all the way to the Dead Sea. The Capillus area bordering on the southern southeastern part of the Sea of Galilee um, and, and Phoenicia on, on the Mediterranean coast. Perea, the country beyond, uh, its name, the meaning of the word, is a portion of the kingdom of Herod the Great occupying the eastern side of the Jordan River Valley from about one-third the way down from the Sea of Galilee to about one-third the way down the eastern shore of the Dead Sea. It did not extend too far inland. Herod the Great's kingdom was divided by the Romans into a tetrarchy of which Herod Antipas received both Perea and Galilee. And that's, where, that's the Herod that we read about in the New Testament with the, um, with the trial of Jesus. By, this time, Herod the, by that time, Herod the Great was already dead. New Testament commentators speak of Christ's Perean ministry, began with his departure from Galilee and ended with the anointing of Mary um, in Bethany. Another, just a colorful map with the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea uh, of that whole region um, that we're talking about. And if you keep that map in mind and you look at the next one, you find a modern Israel. This is modern day Israel, roughly. And just to point out to you that Judea now, uh, Judea didn't ever go that far south uh, as a province, but now Israel go all the way down uh, to the Gulf of Agaba and it borders on Egypt on this side, and uh, Jordan uh, over here on the other side of the Dead Sea, and then uh, Lebanon up in the northwest, and Syria all the way down uh, the Sea of Galilee as well. And then something else that is important from a modern-day perspective is two regions, actually three of them. There is the Golan, Golan Heights. They, that has been in, in the news years ago. Uh, more recently, we haven't heard too much about the Golan Heights, but you are hearing about the West Bank on an ongoing basis, as well as the Gaza Strip. Now, the Gaza Strip roughly corresponds with what was the Philistine or the Philistinian region in the Old Testament era. Um, when Israel became um, a country again in 1947, the United Nations divided the country into these regions, and half of Jerusalem, there's Jerusalem, half of Jerusalem belonged to the West Bank. Uh, West Bank is called West because it's all west of the Jordan River. And that's why it's the West Bank. It always confused me when I heard about the West Bank, no, not knowing exactly what they were talking about. This is under Palestinian or Arabic rule or Palestinian rule. And so is that region as well as the Golan Heights, although it's Israeli occupied. Um, and in 1967, 1948, when Israel became a, a country, uh, that's when it was divided. Half of Jerusalem was given to the West Bank and half to the Jews, to Israel, to the Israelis. Uh, but in 1967, during the Six-Day War, uh, Israel actually took the other half of Jerusalem as well. And that included the Temple Mount area where the Dome of the Rock is. And it's a hugely, hugely contentious issue. Um, and it's like a time bomb. I mean, it, just the wrong word or the wrong move or anything, it will, it will erupt in a, in a total war today. But if you hear about um, Israel, West Bank, and that sort of thing, Gaza Strip, at least it gives you a little bit of perspective. Um, and it's all on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And it, as I said, it goes all the way down uh, to a lot. Southern part of that is pure desert. Then... Uh, on a bigger scale, uh, the yellow little bit there uh, is what is modern-day Israel. And um, you can then get a perspective. This is Egypt, the green, and Syria in the north, Lebanon in the northwest, and then the Jordan, or Jordan over here. And you can see how close is Saudi Arabia and Iraq, and then Iran and Turkey uh, in the north. But you can see how small Israel is compared to the other countries uh, surrounding it. Uh, this is modern-day Israel and her neighbors. When we look at the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, the date is somewhere between 6 and 4 BC. When the date was calculated um, centuries later, um, they didn't have these dates when Jesus was born, obviously, there must have been a calculation error because every bit of evidence points in the direction of Herod the Great dying in the year 4 BC. So as as crazy as it sounds, Jesus was born before Christ. 
uh, he was born four years before Christ or five or six years before Christ. We're not sure. It could be about four or so. Um, in terms of the expectation, uh, I've already mentioned this, but uh, there was a, a, a huge expectation on the part of the Jews that a Messiah, the Messiah, will come and establish the kingdom of God. And Jesus fulfilled every single prophecy in the Old Testament in every possible way. Uh, and especially the book of Matthew, as we will look at it later on, uh, you will find that again and again and again, Matthew goes to the Old Testament and says, this is to fulfill what the prophet wrote or what was written about Jesus. And Jesus fulfilled all of those um, prophecies. Now, before we look at the books of the New Testament, we're going to take a tea break. Okay, welcome back from the break. Uh, we're going to look at the books of the New Testament. Starting from now, we're going to go through every single book in the New Testament. Um, as we look at the background, the context, and the message of each one of the books, we need to simply just first of all recognize the New Testament is literature. And what we find in the New Testament are the Gospels, four of them. Um, and uh, we'll look at three of them tonight in brief. And then we have the book of Acts, which is the history of the early church. And then following that, we have the epistles or letters written by different uh, people, authors, apostles mostly. Thirteen of them written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, and another eight by other authors. We call them general epistles, and we'll look at that uh, as time goes on. And then finally, we have the book of Revelation which is apocalyptic material, and I'll explain more of that. We have looked at that briefly in the Old Testament. Uh, when we looked at Daniel um, and, and some of the other books in the Old Testament, Ezekiel contains some of that. And the Revelation, the book of Revelation, is a New Testament uh, example of apocalyptic uh, material. The writing of the New Testament documents, it's, it's, it's not easy for us to reconstruct what happened in the first century. Uh, you have to bear in mind that Jesus ascended to heaven. And he said, uh, the angels came and appeared to the apostles and said, as he left, so I will, he will be coming back. They were expecting Jesus to come back soon. They were almost expecting Jesus to come back in their lifetime. So initially, it was just going out and spreading the gospel, sharing the gospel, proclaiming that Jesus is king and people need to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. And so the, the notion of writing down the story was not an urgent one initially. But obviously as time progressed, uh, that urgency became more and more recognized. And that is, some of the apostles started dying. There was a, already someone persecuted and stoned to death uh, by the Jews. And, and so as time progressed, uh, the realization that we need to write the story down. But even before the gospel stories... There were the letters of Paul and others as they wrote to early Christians about their behavior, about their faith, uh, to help them understand what they have committed to, uh, why they've made this commitment, how it compares to the Old Testament. And then, of course, there were the false doctrines as well, and those needed to be refuted uh, and, and explained as well. And so the first documents probably to see the light at the time um, were the epistles written by Paul. Perhaps the, the letter of James was one of the, the earliest ones, in my own personal opinion. Then certainly Thessalonians, First and Second Thess Thessalonians, uh, represent the first of the epistles of the Apostle Paul. And it was only in time that the gospel story was no longer simply just related orally, and there was a very, very strong oral tradition, a very uh, reliable oral tradition at the time, but the realization that these stories needed to be written down. And then the book of Revelation was the last uh, to be written uh, towards the end of the first century AD. There were also many other documents. We have looked at this in the first module. I just want to point out once again that we have the what we now call uh, apocalyptic material, uh, not apocalyptic, um, the apocrypha as well as the Pseudepigrapha. Uh, those are extra books that uh, didn't end up in our, uh, in our New Testament canon. Um, and um, there's lots and lots of information about that. But many of those letters and gospel stories and uh, even more revelation type books, all of those saw the light over a period of one, two hundred years after Jesus Christ. Um, but uh, 
in terms of our New Testament canon, the written documents came to an end uh, by about 96 or by the end of that first century. We'll then take a look at what has become known as the Synoptic uh, Gospels. The first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are referred to as, as the Synoptic Gospels because when you look at an overall picture of the three, they look very similar. The word synopsis, when you, when you take an overall look at them, uh, they, they look very, very similar in feel, in language, and sometimes literally verbatim. They are exactly the same. In other words, either they have used one another or they have had a similar source somewhere. And when you do a comparison of that, then they look very similar. Now, it's even at a cursory reading, you go to the Gospel of John and he reads very, very differently from the first three. So we normally classify the first three as similar Gospels and the Gospel of John uh, on his own, sometimes mentioned or, or named the fourth uh, Gospel. And uh, we'll be looking at the fourth gospel next week uh, on its own, but is very different in style and also in approach. When it comes to the placing of the gospels in the Bible, there is no particular chronological order. Uh, in other words, it wasn't as if Matthew was written first and then Mark and then Luke. Uh, in fact, most scholars today believe that Mark was written first and then maybe Matthew, and then probably Luke, and then John, uh, in that particular order. Uh, but even that, you can't necessarily prove with, with, uh, with uh, scientific means or anything like that. When it comes to the synoptic issue, uh, in fact, some of the books will call it the synoptic problem. Uh, it is actually an issue when you look at it. The question that scholars ask themselves is, who wrote first? And if this particular one wrote first, was he then known by the other two? And how much of different uh, material was incorporated? Uh, and so on. And have they consulted different material, other material that we no longer have uh, a copy of in our New Testament? And um, there is the so-called Q document that scholars, when they put all the information together, they say it looks like there was another source or some other sources, and you can classify that as Q document. In other words, that's information that they found somewhere, and they incorporated that into their own story as well. When you look at the picture on the screen, it really gives a good idea of this comparison, how people make, how scholars make a comparison. Uh, here is the Gospel of Mark, and uh, 76% uh, of of Mark, you also find in Matthew and in Luke. But there is about 3% that is unique to Mark. Only 3% is unique to Mark that you do not find in either Mark or Luke. But when you look at Matthew, Matthew contains 35% that is unique to Matthew alone. And then in, in Luke, it's 20% of Luke is unique to Luke that you don't find in any of the other Gospels. Um, and so the purple there, the 41%, 45%, 41 in Matthew, 45% in Luke, and 67, 76% in Mark, that represents the, uh, the common material that you will find in all three of them. With deviations here and there and so on, but as I already mentioned, sometimes they literally verbatim speak the exact same language. Um, and, as you make the comparison in the Greek language. And then there are certain things that are common between Mark and Matthew. There are certain things common between Luke and Mark. And, and so the comparison goes on and on and on. It's not that important for us to actually uh, identify the percentages or anything like that. It simply makes for interesting reading to understand that these three are very, very similar, and yet they, uh, all three of them include unique material, and sometimes two agree, uh, whereas uh, another, the third one leaves it out, uh, and so on and so on. Some of the differences, although the material found in the synoptics is very similar, they also show differences in style. They're clearly three different authors at work, although they must have had either access to one another or there was another source, as I mentioned earlier on. But the reality is that they do give us different perspectives, as we will see in a moment. And the picture that you should have in your mind is of maybe three witnesses. They're standing on, on three different corners and they observe and they see the exact same accident happening. Uh, 
but you will have three different perspectives. When they come uh, to testify, they will give three different perspectives. They, 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 they don't contradict one another necessarily, but there will be different perspectives. And, and that is maybe how we should be looking at those three Gospels. And then certainly the Gospel of John gives a very different perspective. Same story, but it's a different perspective on uh, the same story. Matthew can perhaps be called the gospel to the Jews, as we will see uh, in just a moment. When it comes to the writing of Matthew, the early church uh, believed that Matthew, the disciple of Jesus, uh, was the author of this gospel. Uh, Matthew is also called Levi. Uh, When you compare Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 10, and Mark 2, where he is called um, Matthew and Luke calls him Levi. Maybe I need to get that information uh, correct just to make double sure. Um, Matthew chapter 9, uh, and this is the calling of Matthew. Uh, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew. Now, in Matthew and in Mark, he is called Matthew, whereas Luke calls him Levi. Same person. Um, he was a tax collector. Uh, working for the Roman government officials, collecting taxes from his own people. He was a Jew, and therefore he was hated, hated by the Jews. Uh, all the tax collectors, they, they were simply called sinners and tax collectors. Those are the people going to hell, uh, sort of stuff. And um, so the Jewish community was not in favor of these people, but Jesus came along and stopped at his table, and he called him, and Matthew Uh, believed in Jesus, became a follower of Jesus, and in every list where there is a list of disciples, Matthew is included, uh, either by the name Matthew or by the name Levi. The date of the writing of the book is unknown and difficult to determine, probably between 55 and 70 uh, AD. And uh, the the year 70 AD is going to become a very important one when, when we talk about the documentation we have in the New Testament. Because 70 AD is the is the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And it marks a significant event in Jewish history. In fact, even till today, the temple has never been rebuilt. And so in terms of the minds and the theology of Christianity, as well as the Jews, that date is significant. And uh, when you go through the Gospels, for example, it is um, perhaps strange that this event is never mentioned. If you want to prove that the temple is no longer necessary because the, the church is the temple and the individual Christian is the temple, and uh, you write after the fall of the temple or the destruction of the temple, it would be very strange that you don't mention that. The reason why I actually think that many of the books in the New Testament came into existence before the fall of Jerusalem. Otherwise, it would have been mentioned, at least alluded to, uh, in those books, where, whereas it's not uh, the case. Some of the important contents that we find in the Gospel of Matthew, he begins his story with the genealogy of Jesus. We read that earlier on, linking him to Abraham the Jew, uh, David the king, and God um, by, by virtue of his divine birth and the fact that he was born of the Holy Spirit, conceived by the Holy Spirit. So in that sense, God is his father, if you wish, Uh, And so Matthew is at pains to point that out. He focused on the words of Jesus, um, and not primarily, uh, or not only, but primarily. He focused on the words, what Jesus said. And therefore he includes, uh, when you go through the book of Matthew, at least five major discourses of Jesus. One of which we know very well as the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And uh, this is Matthew collecting certain sayings of Jesus, putting them all together uh, on that mountain. Now, when you go to the book of Luke, you find some of the same material uh, that, you, that you read about in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, but scattered over the book of Luke in different places, uh, different scenarios. And so Matthew seems to collect all of these and put them together because what Jesus said, what he taught, what he preached, what he proclaimed was very important. There's the commissioning of the twelve in Matthew 10, the parables of the kingdom again. Matthew collects them. It wasn't, I think, as if Jesus one day stood and he told maybe 15 or however many parables. I think he told them over time as the people were able to digest it. But Matthew actually collects those parables. 
Some scholars believe that we even may have had some collections of either sayings of Jesus, miracles of Jesus, uh, or places that he went to. Those were collections. And that uh, all of these gospel authors had access to those collections uh, of writings. Whether that is so, again, we can't prove anymore. In Matthew chapter 18, there is a long discourse of Jesus on greatness and forgiveness. And then we have the so-called Olivet Discourse, where Jesus talks about uh, service of Christ, serving of Christ, but uh, it's in the context of uh, future events almost. And uh, much of what we find in those few chapters there uh, actually relate to either the fall of Jerusalem or perhaps some of those may relate to and refer to the second coming uh, of Jesus. And then the book concludes with what has become known as the Great Commission. We know that story or that little, um, th those few verses very, very well. Go and make disciples and baptize them and teach them uh, to, uh, to do everything that I have taught you. Um, and then uh, Jesus sends, sent his disciples uh, into the world with the Great Commission. The message of Matthew is if essentially on Jesus as the fulfillment of prophecy. I've looked at that, or we briefly looked at that before. We don't have time to go into all of these prophecies and, and references, uh, but there is a number of quotes in the, in, the, in the Old Testament or in Matthew where he goes back to the Old Testament and says this happened so that uh, X, Y, Z can, can be fulfilled or what the prophet said uh, can be fulfilled. Jesus is described as the Messiah. He's described as the king, the king of the king, the king of the Jews, actually. Uh, in his genealogy, uh, we, we link him, or Matthew links him to David. He's in the royal line. It's interesting when the magi, or the wise men, came, according to Matthew, they looked for the king of the Jews. Where is the king who was born? Um, and that resulted ultimately in Herod the Great wanting to kill this king uh, that was born. But also as he entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, um, the donkey being the symbol of, of peace, when a king comes to, uh, to visit, uh, when he comes to, to fight a war, he rides on a horse. But when he comes in peace, he rides on a donkey. And uh, so Jesus coming in peace, riding into Jerusalem, and then the people erupted into exclaiming, Hosanna, Hosanna uh, to the king. And then the inscription on the cross, the king of the Jews, to the point where the Jews actually complained and said to Pilate, no, no, you must remove that. And Pilate said, nope, what I wrote, I wrote, and that it will be there. What's, what's written is written. And um, the inscription said, the king of the Jews. And so Matthew points out the fact that Jesus is the king of kings. Matthew is the only gospel using the reference, the kingdom of heaven. The others refer to the kingdom of God in, uh, in Mark and, and Luke. And, and in the kingdom of heaven, the rule of God um, is emphasized through Jesus as a continuation of the Old Testament, um, as a spiritual reality. Now Jesus is no longer going to come and sit on a throne and wear a robe and, 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 and kick the Romans out of the country, but it's a spiritual fulfillment of the fact that Jesus is going to be the King of the Jews. Some of the characteristics of the book of Matthew he presents his material in an orderly fashion. I've uh, already alluded to that, to, to that fact. He, he collects certain pieces of material, like the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's orderly, well laid out, with a particular purpose in mind. There's flow, uh, the sayings of Jesus, the parables are collected into one section. The book is a systematic collection of the deeds and the sayings of Jesus. It is longer than Mark. I don't know who does all the calculation. I didn't do it, but there are 18,300 Greek words in uh, the book of Matthew compared to 11,200 words in the book of Mark. So just by that, you can see how much longer Matthew is to Mark. We get the impression that Matthew was writing primarily to a Jewish uh, recipient or an audience, wanting to prove to them that Jesus is actually the fulfillment of, of God's prophecies in the Old Testament. Jesus is the Messiah that they were expecting. Some of the important passages in Matthew, the birth of Jesus is described uh, for us in Matthew chapter 1, verses uh, 18 all the way to chapter 2 uh, to 23. The Sermon on the Mount, I've referred to the sending of the disciples in chapter 10. The parables of the kingdom, chapter 13. Uh, 
And then the end times, again, I've, I've referred to that already in chapters 20, 24 and 25. And then the last days, the death and the resurrection, described in a fairly long section, although only three chapters. It's, those contain long, long sections where Jesus is uh, brought before the Sanhedrin, handed over to them, uh, his trial before Pilate, and then going on and dying and being buried, and then his resurrection in chapter 28. And then the Great Commission uh, I've already uh, referred to. When we go to the Gospel of Mark, and you start bearing in mind or comparing the two Gospels, uh, as we move on to Mark, we can then talk about the Gospel to the Gentiles. Whereas Matthew focused primarily on Jews and wanting to convince them that Jesus is the expected Messiah, uh, Mark seems to have had some kind of a Gentile audience uh, in mind. In terms of his writing, from the earliest times, the early church accepted that John Mark was the author of this gospel. It was probably the first of the four gospels written uh, sometime after 50 uh, AD. Uh, again, to remind you, if Jesus was born roughly 4 BC, he was about 30 when he uh, started his public ministry. That would make him about 26 uh, AD. Uh, 27 AD, um, and then fast forward another three, four years or so, um, somewhere between 30 and 33, Jesus died and ascended to heaven. Um, and so 50 AD would represent another um, about 15, 17 years or so onwards. Uh, and it was from that point on that the need for written gospels came, became very strong. Um, it may have been written somewhere in 55 or so, but again, we, we have no idea about the date. Now, interestingly enough, when we looked at the New Testament canon in Module 1, one of the criteria for inclusion in the Bible was apostolic authorship or connection to an, a, an apostle. John Mark was not an apostle. And so the question would be, how did his book end, end up in our New Testament canon? Well, this John Mark uh, seems to be the same person who was related to Barnabas. Barnabas took him on the first missionary journey. We read about in Acts chapter 13. And um, when they started the second missionary journey, uh, Barnabas wanted to take Mark with him, but Paul objected and he said, no, Mark, turn around. He, he, uh, uh, he uh, abandoned us during our first missionary trip and I don't want him with us. But Barnabas took Mark on a, on a trip. Now, interestingly enough, as you go through the, the rest of the New Testament, it seems like Mark, and this is according to church tradition, he ended up as a strong supporter of the Apostle Peter, connected to the Apostle Peter, and traveled with him uh, wherever he preached. And eventually, Peter left Jerusalem. He also ended up in other parts of the world where he preached. And then, interestingly enough, in the pastoral epistles in Timothy um, and Titus, Mark is mentioned by Paul as someone who is a fellow worker. So it seems like there was reconciliation ultimately. But the early church connected um, Mark with Peter. And therefore they believed that what he heard from Peter, what Peter preached and talked about Jesus, he heard and ultimately he wrote that down. And that made Mark into an acceptable author of a New Testament book. In terms of the person, Mark, he was a native of Jerusalem. Uh, in Acts chapter 12, verse 12, we read about that. Uh, and he was a companion of Peter. First Peter 5 mentions uh, Mark as his companion. Um, but he was not part of the, uh, one of the original disciples, or the apostles at least. He may have been a disciple of Jesus initially, but we don't know. We don't know where and how he came to know the Lord. And the quote that you have, Mark the Evangelist there, is actually the story I just told you about how Mark pa pans out uh, as a person in the New Testament, uh, being associated with Barnabas, Paul, Peter, and ultimately uh, Paul uh, once again. In terms of the contents of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, it's much shorter than Matthew, as we saw already, probably indicating that he wrote before Matthew did. Now, again, you would, you would now start arguing and, and, and wondering, uh, do you have a large document that someone like Mark takes, he has access to it, he then decides, I'm going to narrow it down. I'm going to cut out maybe some of the um, um, statements or stories, 
because I have a different objective? Or is it the other way around? Has Mark written first, and Matthew had access to Mark, and he said, you know, Mark didn't tell everything, but there's more. I've read more and heard more about him, and I'm going to expand, and I'm going to include more stories about Jesus. So you can, you can really literally argue both ways. Um, some scholars reckon that it is more likely that a person would add than subtract. And therefore, the argument that Mark probably wrote first, but with a Gentile, mainly Gentile audience in mind, he wasn't uh, so concerned about pointing out every single prophecy and detail about Jesus uh, because the Gentiles wouldn't be too concerned about those things uh, anyway. But Mark presents the story in, of Jesus in six stages. We find uh, a prologue, an opening. In fact, what I want to do, I've, I've read something from Matthew, but let me re read something from the Gospel of, of Mark as well. Just the first few uh, verses from this Gospel. The beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the, your way, a voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And he does that for about eight verses, um, as it's now been divided in our Bible. And then in verse 9, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, was baptized by John in the Jordan, and as Jesus, uh, as Jesus was coming out, up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. So within literally 14 verses, Jesus is up and running and preaching. Now that is not the case with Matthew, and certainly not the case with Luke. Luke uses several chapters to explain the birth of Jesus, uh, and how um, the, the uh, shepherds heard it, and how they came, and uh, how they went all the way to Bethlehem, and all, all those kind of things. Mark is a book of action. There's the prologue, then it's Galilee, the, the Galilean ministry, there's an earlier ministry, there's a later ministry from chapter 6 and onwards. Then there's the road to Jerusalem, he's on his way to Jerusalem, and then he's in Jerusalem in chapter 11, and by chapter 14, Jesus is uh, being um, uh, trialed and, and put to death, and the resurrection occurs, and it goes to chapter 16, uh, verse 8. In terms of the message of Mark, um, he seems to have had a Roman or Greek or a Gentile, a non-Jewish uh, readership in mind, as I said before. Um, he, he presents Jesus as the worker, the, the doing part, the, the work of Jesus, the works of Jesus. That's really what he, uh, that, what, what he highlights. And Mark uses the Greek word euthos. Uh, if, you, if you read the Greek, you will find that word uh, 42 times. And the word means immediately or then. And so there's constant movement in the book of Mark. He, he's moving Jesus along, if you wish, uh, in terms of what he did. And he's moving towards the trial uh, and the death of Jesus. And he wants to prove the fact that this is why Jesus came. And so he skips over. I mean, we read about the temptation here in one verse. Now, when you go to Matthew and Luke, it's expanded. It tells the story of the temptation. Mark is not interested in that. Because it's not part of his purpose. His purpose is to bring Jesus on the scene where he's now preaching, he's healing, and he's dying uh, for our sins. So that's where he's heading uh, with the story. He devotes almost 40% of the book to the passion story. That's the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That's, that's the purpose of Jesus coming to this world in order to die, to take the sins of the world upon himself. Some of the characteristics of Mark's gospel. Uh, here is a quote from the New Bible Dictionary. Basically, Mark is the most blunt and clipped of the Gospels. Matthew contains much of specifically Jewish interest, nowhere to be found in Mark. And Luke is much of a medical or of a human interest not found in Mark. And therefore, Mark doesn't waste time, if you wish, uh, by describing too much of the background. The birth of Jesus is not even mentioned. Uh, Jesus is simply on the scene, 
John prepares the way in eight verses, and then Jesus is on the scene and is there uh, to, min to minister. Uh, the genealogy of Jesus is not important because it would be important for Jews, but, but he's not writing for Jews, and so he's not, he's not interested in mentioning the genealogy. Uh, there is action and movement, uh, and then Jesus uh, starts his ministry in, in chapter 1, verse 14. If you've been in module 1, you will remember when we looked at um, the, the text of the New Testament or the Bible, uh, we did refer to the fact that the ending of the book of Mark creates a problem. Uh, it is not mentioned. It is not, uh, in, uh, not contained in the most reliable early uh, manuscripts. And you will find that particular note in the NIV, the most reliable early manuscripts. And other ancient witnesses do not have Mark. Chapter 16, verses 9 to 20. Now, if that is the case, and it is the case with most of the manuscripts we have, the most reliable ones, then it does create a problem in terms of the ending of Mark. How does he end? He ends with, uh, trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Full stop. That's the end of the book. Um, and it's a very abrupt ending. And so it's no wonder that an ending was added to, to actually prove that there was more Jesus rose from the dead. He sent his disciples into the world. And that is what this ending is all about that we now have uh, in our Gospel of Mark. I'm not going to go into the detail again, but just to point out that that is a particular problem when it comes to the actual text of the book of Mark. Some of the passages to read, um, in, introducing Jesus in uh, chapter 1. Uh, some of the parables, and they would be very, very similar, in fact the same, and sometimes verbatim the same, as you will find in either Matthew or Luke. And then the healing of a deaf and dumb man in chapter 7. And uh, Mark also has some things to say about uh, the end times in chapter 13. Takes us to the Gospel of Luke. It is a Gospel of Compassion. And in terms of readership, uh, we'll talk about that in a moment, but Matthew to Jews... Mark probably to non-Jews. Luke may have had a much broader or inclusive uh, approach uh, in mind. Uh, from the introduction of the gospel, and we've got to read this because Luke actually tells us some of the things that I've already alluded to or mentioned to you. He says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know this, uh, the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now, interesting Luke tells us that he has done his research. He tells us that he consulted. He says, many have attempted to write this down. And I have consulted them. I've looked at it. I've now decided to take some of that information and put it down in an orderly account to you, uh, whoever it is, Theophilus. The Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts um, seem to be two volumes of the same work. Uh, as you come to the ending of Luke, and you pick it up again in the beginning of the book of Acts, uh, and we'll look at Acts um, next week, but let me just uh, mention this to you, and you will see the similarity. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions. Now, you can immediately see the correspondence between Luke and Acts. Uh, it seems like he he told the story of Jesus. In fact, he calls it what Jesus began to do. And then he brings that to a conclusion with the, the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension, very briefly mentioned. But he picks up the story with the ascension of Jesus in the book of Acts. And he continues the story because it's one single story. It's the story of Jesus, um, as it were, part one. The story of the church is part two, but the story continues. It's the same story. And that's the way we need to look at these two books. The book was probably written around about 64, uh, because um, maybe in a year or two, around 64, give and take a year or two, um, in that year or so, uh, the Apostle Paul would have been at the roughly the end of the two-year period that Luke mentions at the end of 
Acts. In Acts chapter 28, he mentions the fact that, that Paul was in prison for two years in the city of Rome. Um, and so Luke and Acts, if they were written roughly, as, or, um, roughly in the same time, they would be two volumes written uh, in a few months' time or maybe in a year's time or so, and that would put him about 64. The gospel is addressed to a particular uh, person called Theophilus. Now, Theophilus can also be a translation or can be, can be translated as lover of God. And you can see the word theo, theos and also philos or phileo. You can see the, both of those words in the word Theophilus. And whether it refers to an individual uh, or whether it's simply a representative of ge a Gentile audience, we, we no longer know. Um, because he is not known from elsewhere in the New Testament or from uh, early church tradition. When it comes to the person Luke, uh, again we have a similar situation to that of Mark. He was not one of the early disciples or apostles uh, of Jesus. He was a doctor, Colossians chapter 4 verse 14, and a companion of Paul, Philemon uh, verse 24, uh, clearly uh, uh, says that, that he was a companion of, of Paul. And many believe that the we passages, uh, we went on board of the ship and we sailed for many days and we were in the storm. Those passages in the first person plural that Luke actually talks about himself, that he was with Paul on that ship when the ship uh, wrecked uh, and so on. We have no information about his conversion, his background, nothing whatsoever. He uh, seems to be a, a non-Jewish convert uh, but we, we, again, we're not sure about that, but he was closely associated with Paul. And again, from a New Testament canon point of view, that would make him acceptable as an author of one of the books of the New Testament. By way of an outline, there is a prologue. Um, I've read that already. And then he goes on and he says, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, now you need to read Herod the Great. That's against the background that I shared with you earlier on. There was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. And then he goes on to tell us about the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist. Now, as I said, if you compare this with Mark, Mark is not even remotely interested in birth stuff. Here is Luke. He tells us in detail how John the Baptist was born, let alone Jesus. When he gets to Jesus, a couple of chapters on. And then you only get to the birth of Jesus. So he's at pains to sketch the whole background and the context. And wonderfully so, because if it wasn't for that, we would be so much poorer in our knowledge of the birth and the early part of, um, and, and the background of the birth of Jesus. Then from chapter 4 onwards, we find uh, Jesus on the scene. Um, his genealogy, by the way, is only added in chapter 3. Uh, when you go to the genealogy. But then in, in chapter 4, it starts with the temptation of Jesus. Uh, and then he goes to Galilee, uh, where he's rejected in Nazareth, his own hometown. And then we have the Perean ministry in chapter 9, uh, verse 51. Uh, and from that point on, Luke says that Jesus set his sight on Jerusalem. And he was pushing towards Jerusalem, knowing that this was the final journey and he was going to end up in Jerusalem uh, and being executed there. Um, then we have his Jerusalem ministry in chapter 18 to 21. The Passion, the whole story told in, uh, in, in a few cha chapters there. And then he has the resurrection in chapter 24. And so that gives us a brief outline of the book of Luke. In terms of the message of the book of Luke, he tells us his purpose in chapter 1, uh, where he says to Theophilus, I want you to know with certainty about the things that happened before us and the things that have been fulfilled among us. And so it's to give certainty, certainty to Theophilus. And, and as I said, Theophilus may be a representative. He may even just be a name representing a Gentile audience. But it seems like it's a very broad uh, audience, inclusive of both Jew and Gentile. Uh, but, but the focus may be, may be more on uh, non-Jew than actually trying to convince or uh, uh, to prove to Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. His main emphasis is on the humanity and the compassion of Jesus. You find more stories about compassion in Luke than you find in Matthew and Mark. And uh, no wonder, because Luke was a doctor. And so he would look at, at people with their ailments and ailments and problems with a, with a different eye to that of Matthew and Luke. And so he would highlight that. 
uh, he portrays Jesus as God and man. Those two aspects of Jesus come out very, very strongly, uh, filled with authority and compassion. Uh, Luke believed that the story of Jesus, as we find it in the Gospel of Luke, was only the beginning, and that the book of Acts is the continuation as the church is established and the church and the gospel of Jesus begins to spread around the world. Some of the characteristics, uh, uniqueness of, of the gospel of Luke, he includes extensive description of the birth of Jesus, uh, chapter 1 and 2, uh, and also in chapter 3. Then the gospel of Luke emphasizes prayer, more than Matthew and, and Mark actually, the compassion for the outcast, the uh, women play a major role in the book of Luke. The sick, uh, needy people. And then also he emphasizes the Holy Spirit. And uh, a again, no wonder that Luke is the one who tells us the story of Pentecost uh, in the book of Acts in chapter 2. The author places much uh, more emphasis on non-Jewish nations, the Gentiles, than uh, Matthew and Mark actually. Some of the stories and parables are so unique to Luke that they really have a really special place in our hearts. The, the Good Samaritan, for example, is unique to Luke. You don't find that story in the other Gospels. Uh, the visit to Simon's house, where the woman comes and she weeps on Jesus' feet and then dries his feet with her hair, uh, that story is told by Luke only. The prodigal son, again, it's uh, in chapter 15, is one of those uh, wonderful stories that all of us know very, very well. The story of Zacchaeus in Jericho, uh, again, unique to the Gospel of Luke. Some of the passages I want to highlight, the birth of Christ um, is actually a long section. Most of us know the story around Christmas uh, very well. The Good Samaritan, the lost and found stories, uh, including the prodigal son uh, in chapter 15, story of Zacchaeus in chapter 19. And then Luke's particular perspective on the passion story. Uh, in fact, you really get a, a, a good picture of the passion when you read all three of the Gospels and the way that they describe the passion uh, of Jesus Christ. Some of the interesting facts about the Synoptic Gospels, the parables. Jesus used parables to teach spiritual truths. These are everyday stories, whether it's a sower out there or a king going off to receive his crown, uh, leaving some of his servants behind. Uh, all sorts of daily, daily events. He uh, used them to highlight spiritual uh, truths uh, for his audience. Um, the synoptics include many of Jesus' parables. Uh, the interesting thing is that you almost don't find any of that in the Gospel of John. The parables are almost all in the three synoptic Gospels. The Gospel of Luke contains the largest total number of parables, 24 of them. The largest number of unique parables, 10 of them, that you don't find anywhere else. The Gospel of Matthew contains 23 parables, and only 6 of them are unique to Matthew. The Gospel of Mark contains 8 parables, of which only one, the parable of the growing seed, uh, is unique to the Gospel of Mark. The miracles, uh, so it's the parables, that's the preaching of Jesus, the miracles, what Jesus did. The Gospels tell us about the many miracles that Jesus performed. Uh, the purpose of those miracles, um, several different purposes. He, uh, he shows his authority, uh, whether he calms a storm or heals a person. Um, he, he basically demonstrates his control as the creator of the universe over everything. He can literally stand up and say to the ocean, be calm, and the storm uh, disappears. It also tells us that he has power over evil. Many of the illnesses in those days were interpreted as demonic, uh, demonic activity. And when Jesus heals a person, or he simply literally commands a demon to leave, uh, he, he shows that he has power and authority over the demonic world as well. It also shows his care for people. When he stops a widow, uh, when, when they take her son out to be, to be buried, and he raises that son back to life again, he shows his compassion for a widow who was totally dependent on the income from her son. Uh, she would be destitute if that son is no longer alive. And so just the care of Jesus for people. So that, those are all the purposes or some of the purposes of the miracles. Matthew and Luke each records at least 19 specific miracles performed by Jesus and Mark about 14 miracles. When it comes to the beginning of the Gospels, 
uh, interesting comparison. Matthew begins his gospel with Abraham and David and shows how Jesus comes from the line of Abraham, the origin of Israel, and David, the true Jew or the king. Mark begins his, uh, his gospel with Jesus' baptism. Um, emphasizing the fact that Jesus came to do the will of the Father. You see the emphasis on action again. And then Luke starts as far back as showing Jesus' link with Adam. Adam is the Son of God, and therefore the direct link with God, showing that Jesus is the true man, and the man for every human being uh, in the world. Some of the gospel symbols, uh, this is not really that important, but church tradition has it. And it's just a tradition that, that started somewhere, and really it's, no, it's of no spiritual significance. But uh, there are four beasts or creatures mentioned uh, in the book of Revelation. And over time, it has become customary to refer to those four as um, being represented by the different gospels. Matthew uh, is the human or the angel in the, in the picture in, in Revelation. Mark is the lion. Uh, Luke is the ox and John uh, is the eagle. And whether that has any significance, I rather doubt that. But as you read in the Synoptic Gospels, I make some suggestions about the chapters to get a feel for those books. Uh, I'm sure most of you have read at least parts, if not all, of the Gospels. And I would encourage you to do more of that to get more of a feel for that. Now next time we'll, take, we'll continue our journey through the New Testament when we look at uh, the book of John, the Gospel of John, and then also the book of Acts. And that's um, it for this time, and I'll see you next time. May the Lord bless you.